Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Please welcome Monica Crowley. <laughs> we, uh, we prevailed on, on Monica to come a little early so she could visit with you about her, um, her private time, her personal time, her professional time with Richard Nixon when he was in New Jersey from 1990 to 1994. But before I turn the mic over to her, I just want to make sure you know that she's a graduate of Colgate. She has a PhD from Columbia. And because she went to Columbia and not Berkeley, she knew how to write a good letter. <laughs> so she, one day, one day she wrote one to Richard Nixon. And it caught his attention. Now imagine the amount of mail uh, that, that, that he got every day. He read it and said, I'd like to see it. So she went to see him, and they sat in that beautiful office that I've had the pleasure of, of uh, uh, visiting with him in as well. And they talked for two hours. And she became his foreign policy assistant. So she was with him on a daily basis for hours and traveled with him to China when he first went back to see how they had grown since his initial visit. So she's qualified to talk foreign policy and Richard Nixon, and the two of them make a pretty good pair of Richard Nixon and foreign policy. And when you add Monica Crowley, you're in for an interesting talk. Monica Crowley. Thank you. Isn't he the best? Sandy Quinn is the best. A round of applause for Sandy, who I haven't seen in so long. And it's such a joy to see him. And I have to say, it's so moving for me to be here again, because the last time I was here was for President Nixon's funeral in 1994. And I just haven't had the opportunity to come back until now. And Sandy asked me just to share a couple of, of personal stories about the President and Mrs. Nixon. And I just want to say that he, and I'm getting emotional about it now because he changed my life. He was an extraordinary man in every way. He was brilliant and visionary. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He was warm and kind and generous. And whenever I see his name in the press, you know, I, I always say, okay, here it comes. And I'm always prepared for the worst, and I, I'm always prepared to deal with it. But it, it never ceases to upset me because they've turned him, the left, the media, have turned him into a caricature. And all of the things I just said about him were absolutely true. And the press never let that come across, ever. Um, he did change my life. He saw that letter, and actually his, his secretary at the time was a Puerto Rican girl from the Bronx named Carmen. Carmen was about five feet tall, and she was a spitfire, and she, she was in charge of all of the mail at the time. This was 1990, and I had read one of President Nixon's foreign policy books, and at that time he was writing a new foreign policy book every two years, and one of my professors at Colgate who was pretty much the only conservative professor on the campus, and I was pretty much the only conservative student on the campus, he took me under his wing and he gave me a stack of books to read and he knew that I had fallen in love with national security and American foreign policy. And he said, go home this summer before your senior year, read these books and when you come back in the fall, we'll talk about what you've learned from them. The first book I chose to read of those he lent to me was 1999, Victory Without War, as you all know. Um, President Nixon at the time, I guess he wrote that in about 1988, so this was around 1989. And it had such a tremendous impact on my thinking that I wrote him a letter, as Sandy said. And it was a substantive letter, it was not necessarily a fan letter, although of course I was a huge fan of his. But I wrote the letter just because I felt compelled to let this person know, regardless of who he was, that he had educated me and had ins inspired me and set me on a path for the rest of my life just by changing my thinking. Mailed the letter, forgot about it, never dreamed I'd get a response. And I always say when I talk to, to kids, I always use this story as a great lesson of American ingenuity and initiative and creativity. I always tell the kids, write that letter, 
because you never know what could come of it. And about a month later, I went to my mailbox and I took uh, bills and things coming at me and there was a handwritten note from President Nixon to me. And that was the beginning of my lesson in understanding who this man was because the fact that Carmen had pulled my letter out of the, the vats of mail that he got every day and said, you know what, I think, I think President Nixon ought to see this. Here's this young college kid, she's passionate about national security, I think he ought to read this. She put it on his desk with like letters from Caspar Weinberger and George Schultz and then here I am, you know, this junior at Colgate. And the fact he took the time to not only read my letter but respond with a handwritten note told me from that instant that's who Richard Nixon was. Before I, I say any more, I just want to say yesterday I, I had the great fortune of going up to the Reagan Ranch in Santa Barbara, and I don't know if you've ever been there or seen it, but it's the most modest, humble place. Tiny, small, regular furniture, nothing fancy at all. And as I was there, I also thought about that little clapboard house right outside here in, in the groves of Southern California, and I thought, you know what, that's America. That is America, and we've lost a little bit of that. We've lost our sense of that. When I think of Richard Nixon, I think of that clapboard house. I think of a man who came from absolutely nothing, nothing, and through the sheer force of his own will and brilliance and hard work and sacrifice, got to be the most powerful person on the face of the earth. But the way President Nixon looked at power, the way he looked at the presidency, was not for self-aggrandizement. It wasn't about building himself up. It was having power for the sake of what he could do with it. And what he wanted to do with it was change the world to serve America's interests and to serve the American people. A Couple of, of little stories that'll tell you also who he was. Um, he and Mrs. Nixon had an adorable relationship. I mean, they loved each other so much. And, you know, sometimes it got on each other's nerves, like every relationship, right? Every marriage, they get on each other's nerves. One day he was getting ready to go to Russia on like a two or three week trip. And he had asked me to come over to the house and bring him some materials, so I, I go over and I'm ringing the front doorbell and nobody is answering. I can hear voices in the house, so I know they're there, but nobody is answering the door. So I tried the door and it was locked, so I, I you know, you don't want to be a pest. I'm like leaning on the doorbell, nobody is answering. So I thought I heard the voices in the kitchen. This was at their house in New Jersey. So I walked around and sure enough, I saw them moving in the kitchen. So I went to the kitchen door and I gently knocked on the door and he said, oh my God, Monica's standing outside. How long have you been outside? Come in, come in, come in. So I walked in and the, the kitchen was chaos. Mrs. Nixon was there. I think Julie was there. The dogs were running through the house and he had like four pieces of luggage lined up for his trip. And I said to him, Mr. President, I said, you know, um, we're really gonna miss you in the office. And this was a trip I wasn't going with him on. And uh, he said, yeah. He said, uh, you know who else is gonna miss me? Mrs. Nixon. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Belly laugh. And then he said, you know, Monica, today is her birthday. And she nodded, she says, it's my birthday. And the White House at the time, the George H.W. Bush White House, had sent her a huge card where everybody in the White House, including the President, Mrs. Bush, had signed it for her. So they showed me the card, and then he said, uh, you know, it's her birthday, and he said, her gift is that I'm leaving for two weeks. <laughs> and she looked at me and she went, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> um, when Mrs. Nixon passed away, I was here for that funeral also, and President Nixon was a man who felt things very deeply, loved his family deeply, but was also from that generation, the greatest generation, which believed you should be stoic in public. And so he said to me a couple of things. First, he said, when she was passing away, he said, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. And I said to him, you will do this. And on the day she was dying, and Mrs. Nixon, we used to joke that Mrs. Nixon had nine lives because she would get really sick. She would go through spells where she would get very, very sick. And then she would come back and she'd be stronger than ever and more energy than all of us put together. But this time we knew it was different and we knew she was coming to an end. 
And he, that day, he sent his car from, this is Bergen County, New Jersey, northern New Jersey. He sent his car uh, to go pick up Tricia and Ed Cox and grandson Christopher, who I just saw last week, by the way, handsome young man, doing very well as a lawyer. But he sent his limousine with his driver into New York City to pick them up and bring them to Mrs. Nixon's bedside. So I'm sitting in the, in the office, and his office was down the hall, so I could always see when he was coming and going. And I saw his door sort of swing open, and I saw him walk, and he didn't know what to do with himself. This is a man who was always so focused and directed, and yet his partner of about 50 years was about to leave him, and he did not know what to do with himself. And I could see him pacing. So I, went, I got up and I went down the hall, and the office was empty. There were only two or three uh, of us in the office. Carmen, who was trying to make some arrangements, and his chief of staff at the time, and that was it. So the office was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. So I went over to talk to him a little bit, and he kept telling me he was fine. And then he said to me, Monica, I need a favor. And I said, anything, Mr. President. And he said, I need you to take me home. And picture this, okay, so I'm... 22, 23. My car at the time was, <laughs> was a 1990 Nissan Sentra, okay? Um, with like Madonna tapes and then Duran Duran tapes on the seat. And I thought, first of all, I, I loved him to death. I adored him, but I hated driving him home because in my mind, my mind went wild with every possible imaginable traffic crisis, accident, somebody bumping me, I've got Richard Nixon in the car, my God. So I always tried to, tried to avoid it, but I knew that day I couldn't avoid it. So I said, of course, Mr. President. So I ran out to my car, I cleared out all the Madonna tapes, threw them in the trunk, and he came out and he was carrying his briefcase. And one thing about President Nixon, the way he left the presidency, he carried that burden physically, physically, like this his shoulders rolled forward. You could literally see the weight of that decision to leave the presidency and to leave it the way he did. And on that day, faced with the death of his wife, it was even more pronounced. And so I pulled my car up and I got out and I opened the passenger door for him. And he, he was struggling to get in because remember he had that attack of phlebitis, which almost killed him. So he had difficulty with his right leg. So I literally helped him into my car. And I'm apologizing, it's a Nissan Central. Oh my God, it's Japanese, a car. I'm like, oh my God, the American president, a Japanese car. I'm like, oh God, please don't let anybody photograph us. So I get him in the car and I go to put the, start the engine and I say, Mr. President, could you please put on your seatbelt? I wasn't going anywhere with him, not wearing a seatbelt, okay? So he says to me, uh, oh, okay, now, President Nixon was brilliant in every way, but one thing about him was he was the most unmechanical guy you would ever meet. He'd pick up the phone, the whole phone would go flying across the room. <laughs> Another time, Julie was in the office and she, uh, he comes out and Julie's standing there talking to me and he says, uh, Monica, I have something going to the White House. Uh, I don't want to, what do you call, fax? He's like, I don't, I don't wanna, because that means they take a picture and send it, right? And I was like, well, he said, so um, I need the president to have this by tomorrow morning. Can you send it, you know, Pony Express? <laughs> Julie looks at me, she's like, Daddy, it's Federal Express, you know, Pony Express. <laughs> so anyway, I get, I get him in the car, I ask him to put on his seatbelt, and he looks at me, he's like, oh, okay, but I could see the fear in his eyes about grappling with the seatbelt. So he's struggling with it, and he can't get it. And I'm thinking, okay. So I turned the engine off. Excuse me, Mr. President, not getting fresh. I leaned over, I said, okay, all right, here we go, click. Okay, so now it's set. And I go to turn over the engine, and I feel his hand on my arm. And I looked at him, and he said, I can't go home. It still breaks my heart. And I looked at him and I said, okay. I said, where would you like me to take you? And he thought for a second and he said, I just need some time to think before I face what I'm gonna face and have to say goodbye to Mrs. Nixon. So he said, could you take me to Bear Mountain? Which was about 
45 minutes north of Bergen County over the New York State line. And I said, of course, I had no idea where I was going. <laughs> I've never been to Mar Bear Mountain. I have no, I've got the president, my Nissan Sentra, I, uh, and he's asking me to go someplace I've never been. Of course, Mr. President, yes. Okay, so I said, but I'm counting on you. And he had no sense of direction. It was the blind leading the blind. I said, okay, Mr. President, but I'm gonna rely on you to tell me where to go. No problem, Monica. I turn over the car and boom, up comes Rush Limbaugh's voice because I had it always said on WABC in New York. And he said, Monica, I love Rush, but can you turn it off? I need silence. And so I turned it off and we drove in silence to Bear Mountain about 40 minutes, got to Bear Mountain, got him out of the seat belt. He opened the door and he just, he kind of strolled away from me for about 20, 30 minutes. And then he came back and he straightened himself up and he said, okay, I'm ready to go home. And I brought him home. And it was a moment, and I write about this in, in my first Nixon books. That was President Nixon. Everybody thinks of the genius of Richard Nixon. People know him as a visionary, but people don't know those private private moments. He, um, when she passed away and we were here for the funeral, I remember I was seated and probably like the 12th row back, something like that, and Kissinger came in and I had met him a couple times and Haldeman walked in and I hear Haldeman's booming voice and he says, Heinz, which is what he always called Henry Kissinger, Heinz, and the two of them sat in front of me and they were talking and, and it was great to watch that, that interaction. And then I saw Mrs. Nixon's casket being brought in and I was watching him like a hawk and I could see him start to shake a little bit and he broke down and I'm sure you all remember that. He broke down and he just sobbed. And later that night, he asked to see me and I went to go, to go see him and he said to me, I'm sorry. And I said, what are you sorry for? And he said, well, for breaking down like that. I, you know, I didn't want to break down like that. And I said, Mr. President, this is your wife of 50 years. Everybody understands. The country understands. That was a beautiful thing. And he, he kind of let it all out at that point and just sobbed and sobbed with me for about 20, 30 minutes. And I just gently held his hand. And then when he was composed, he said, okay. And I got up and walked away. President Nixon was such an extraordinary man. There's, there's one time he, after Mrs. Nixon passed away, you know, he was a little lonely. So, you know, I was working with him Monday through Friday and then trying to go to graduate school to get that PhD at Columbia. By the way, he, Nixon always used to say to me, Monica, uh, so you made it through the Ivy League, still a conservative? How did that happen? How did you do that? I, no, and he was like genuinely interested. He's like, I'm not joking. How did you do that? those Marxist professors, and he was right about the Marxist professors. Um, another little story. I started working with him right after I graduated from Colgate, and I was going to go to law school, and I, I was accepted at Villanova Law School, and I was all set to go because I thought, well, that's the next step, and I guess I better go do that. And I was just supposed to work for him for that summer and then go to law school. And one day toward the end of the summer, he asked to see me and I went into his office and I sat down and he goes, Monica, we have something very important to talk about. And I said, yes, sir, what is it? And he said, you're not going to law school. Now, as a Virgo who has a five-year plan, okay, I said, wait, what? And he said, you're not going to law school. And I said, okay. He said, first of all, you're going to stay and work with me, which is an opportunity of a lifetime. And then he said, Monica, I'm a lawyer. The country has enough lawyers. <laughs> we do not need another one, especially one whose heart isn't in the law. And he said to me, your heart is not in the law. He said, stay and work with me. And if you really feel that you need an advanced degree, go get an advanced degree, a master's degree, or a PhD in American foreign policy, national security, which is what your passion is anyway. So once again, he changed my life. He changed my life by answering my letter. He changed my life by setting me on a completely different career track. He knew what was best for me more than I knew at the time what was best for me. And uh, here's another extraordinary thing he did. I, I wanted to continue working with him while I was going to graduate school. 
So I chose only two schools to apply to. I chose Columbia University and Princeton because I wanted to be within driving distance of him. So I, I went into the office one day and as I was doing my applications and I asked him to write me a letter of recommendation. <laughs> and he, he looked at me and he broke into this big smile and then he took his glasses off and then he really looked at me and he said, are you sure? <laughs> And I, I did, didn't even register, and then I went, oh, <laughs> yeah. These two college campuses that were aflame during the Vietnam War, screeching that he was a war criminal, two of the most left-wing universities in the country, and here I am, and I'm asking him for a letter of recommendation to get into a, an international relations program. So he, and then he got very serious, and he said, Monica, I really want you to think about this, because I want you to go get this degree, but I'm afraid if I write you this letter, it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt your chances. Again, this is President Nixon putting people he cared about before himself. So I looked at him square in the eye, and I, I said, you betcha. And he broke into this big smile, and he said, okay, I'll have them ready for you for tomorrow. And he wrote me the most beautiful letters of recommendation. And the end of that story is, even though I had all A's, straight A's at Colgate, and near perfect scores on the um, GMAT to get in, Princeton said no. <laughs> Columbia said yes. And I, when I started at Columbia, I later heard that it was like this big faculty thing, like, oh my god, look at who we got a letter from, Richard Nicklin. Um, but they did, they let me in, and he was, when I was going to graduate school while working for him, I would go to Columbia in the morning, go to class, and then I would drive out to his office in New Jersey and go spend the afternoon working with him. And he would say things like, I, he goes, okay, Monica, I'm ready for you now. And I would walk in and sit down and he would say, okay, Monica, tell me what you learned in school today. <laughs> and I would, I would tell him, because I was in the international relations program, so I would say, well, Mr. President, today, uh, we learned about hegemonic stability theory. And he looked at me and he would take his glasses off and he'd go, uh-huh, I don't think Brezhnev had hegemonic stability theory in mind when we were negotiating the SALT I agreement, but that's a different matter. And it occurred to me even at the time that I was getting the most extraordinary education anybody could possibly have because during the day I was at Columbia getting a formal education in terms of the theory of American foreign policy and how the world supposedly worked. And then in the afternoons and at night and on weekends, I was sitting with a master practitioner, somebody who actually carried those policies and theories out in practice and knew that a lot of those theories were pure bunk <laughs> and that that was not how the real world really worked. So to have that dual education at the time was extraordinary and he was so generous in letting me go to class in the morning and then come to him in the afternoon. He never hassled me about it. I still had to do my job, but he made those accommodations for me. I will always remember him. I miss him every single day. And frankly, I think the country misses him every single day. One final story and then I'm happy to take your questions. Um, he, he was, so incredibly clever politically. The only other person that I've ever seen have an encyclopedic knowledge of every precinct in America, precinct now, voting precinct, how they vote, who was currently representing them, how they were going to vote. The only other one apart from Richard Nixon is Karl Rove. Whenever I see Karl Rove, I get flashes of President Nixon because I see that same level of knowledge. Um, he, he, in 1991, okay, 92, he said to me, okay, we're gonna have another presidential election, and I was beside myself. I was so thrilled to be able to go through presidential election learning uh, from President Nixon and getting his insights every day into the campaign. So he didn't pay attention at all to a young whippersnapper out of Arkansas named Bill Clinton at all, kind of discounted the guy. He said, oh, he's from Arkansas, he's a governor, he's not gonna, he's never gonna make it. But then he started to see something in Bill Clinton that impressed him, and that was the incredible uh, talent for retail politicking. 
He knew how to work a rope line. He seemed innately intelligent, and he could really shake a crowd. And so President Nixon really started to pay attention to Bill Clinton. Then he started to think, well, there's no way that this guy could actually make it because he's got all the moral issues, <laughs> as President Nixon used to call it. He's got the women issues, Monica. He's got the problems. Uh, and I would say, yeah, but you know, Mr. President, I don't know. I think the country might be beyond that. I'm not saying that's the right thing, but it might not matter to as many people anymore. He's like, you may be right about that. So he was cautiously watching Bill Clinton and the rise of Bill Clinton. And then on the Republican side, we had the incumbent president, George H.W. Bush, who all of a sudden faced a primary challenge from none other than Patrick J. Buchanan, one of President Nixon's, of course, top speechwriters. And Nixon would say, at the beginning, he would say, you know, it's fine that Pat is running, and it's a good thing because he's lighting a fire under President Bush and getting him focused, and you know, he's gonna be a better candidate because he's had to fend off Pat. But at some point, Pat's gotta stop this. Well, Pat didn't stop it because he won the New Hampshire primary, and then he continued, and he had some real momentum for a while. Well, come June of 1992, um, <laughs> Pat was still in the race, and it was really starting to hurt President Bush. So President Nixon said to me, okay, I've had it with Buchanan, Monica, but I don't know how to tell him. I said, you're the former president of the United States. I think you can just tell him. And he said, no, I don't know how. I don't know what to do. So we get a phone call, and Pat Buchanan wants to come up and see President Nixon. So Nixon says yes. And again, this is June of 92, so it's already late in the primary season, and Buchanan is still in the race. So Pat and Mrs. Buchanan come, and they're behind closed doors with President Nixon for about five minutes when all of a sudden I hear my intercom on my desk ring, and it's the president. He says, Monica, would you come down here, please? So I thought he was just going to hand me something, and so I went down, ill-prepared, and he s I walk in and he says, close the door. And I'm thinking, here it comes. Something is coming. I'm not sure what. Something is coming. And he said, Monica, this is Pat and Shelley Buchanan. I shook their hands. Great to meet you. And I went to turn to leave. And he said, oh, no, Monica, have a seat. <laughs> I had a seat. And President Nixon looked at me. And he said, Monica, uh, at first he said, Pat, Monica and I have been talking about the presidential race and the campaign. <laughs> True story. And he said, uh, and Monica had a very interesting observation. <laughs> True story. And at that point, I realized I'm being set up. Here we go. And he looked at me and he said, Monica, why don't you tell Pat what you think he should do? I swear. And I looked at him like, you got me. You got me. Uh, and so I very diplomatically said, and Buchanan knew what was going on. He broke into a big smile. He very patiently listened. And he knew it wasn't me saying it. It was actually President Nixon saying it. So he ultimately leaves the race, and Bill Clinton emerges as the front runner. And President Nixon's watching him very keenly, and he's very impressed by his intellect, his ability to learn fast, and his ability to, to really work crowds and get them jazzed. So on the day that, on election day, actually election night, Bill Clinton wins the presidency. And President Nixon takes out a piece of his engraved stationery, and he writes President-elect Clinton a note. And he showed it to me before he sent it, Pony Express, to the president-elect. And it said, Dear Mr. President-elect, Mrs. Nixon joins me in congratulating you on a very well-run race. Note, he didn't say congratulations on winning. He said congratulations on a very well-run race. And something like, I'm here at your disposal if you ever need, blah, blah. Now, what I didn't know at the time is that presidential etiquette, it's sort of unspoken that if the sitting president or a former president contacts you by phone or by uh, written correspondence, you should turn around that correspondence or that phone call within 24 hours to the best of your ability. That's sort of just the way it's done in that tight little club. Well, President Nixon sends off his letter and months go by, <laughs> months go by without a response. And President Nixon kind of wrote it off and he said, um, he said, you know what, Monica, it's okay. He said, you know, I wrote him a letter and he never responded and that's all right. He said, you know, he's of a different generation and he said he's a different political party. And you know, his wife tried to impeach me, <laughs> which is also true. 
Hillary Clinton sat on the impeachment committee as a young lawyer. So he said, so I'm not really expecting anything. That was, let's see, election night the letter went out, or the next day, Bill Clinton's inaugurated January of 93. About March of 93, phone call into President Nixon's office. Carmen answers the phone. President Nixon's office, this is the White House operator. I have the President of the United States for President Nixon. Carmen starts laughing. <laughs> the tiny Puerto Rican girl from the Bronx did not believe this. She was not having it, okay? And she said, who is this? And she was a great protector of the president, so she literally was not having it. When she finally determined that it was President Clinton actually calling for President Nixon, she went, her eyes got huge. She said, just a minute. She puts the president on hold, or the White House operator, flies into President Nixon's office, breathless. Mr. President, you're not going to believe, on the line, the line that's really blinking. And he said, what? Carmen, what is it? What is it? She said, it's President Clinton calling for you. And he took off his glasses. He also did not believe her said, come on, Carmen. And he said, she said, no, sir. It, it really is the president. So his eyes got big, and then he went like this. Get out. He picks up the phone, and in my office, I could see his line lit. And they, the two of them talked for a good 20 minutes, 30 minutes almost. And afterwards, he called me in, and he said, well, I had an interesting phone call today, Monica. And I said, yes, sir, I, I heard. And he said he, he invited me down to the White House which was a major thing. Because remember, all of President Nixon's successors, they all, with the exception of Jimmy Carter, they all turned to him for advice. Domestic political advice, foreign policy advice. But they never gave him any credit, ever. And they used to sneak him in through the side door. They never alerted the White House press that he was coming, never alerted the White House photographer. And even though President Nixon was a great political animal and he understood that he was toxic and he certainly did not want to hurt his successors, but I think on a personal level it actually did kind of hurt him. But he always put the country first. So he went, he would sit with President Reagan, George H.W. Bush, he would sit with these guys for hours in the White House over Diet Coke or multiple Diet Cokes and they would just talk about the state of the world. And Nixon actually guided a lot, a lot more uh, policy than most people think in his post-presidential years. So President Clinton invites him to the White House, and President Nixon once again is expecting to go in underground through you know, this labyrinthine, dark passageway so that nobody knows he's there. And his driver said, no, Mr. President, we have word from the Clinton White House that you're to be brought in to the West Portico. And Nixon went, are you sure about that? And they said, yes, sir. And sure enough, this is how clever Bill Clinton was and how smart he was. He was waiting for President Nixon. He had the entire White House press corps lined up. And when Nixon's car drove up and the door was open for him, all of the flashes went off and he was genuinely stunned. Happily surprised and genuinely stunned, and it was such a great moment for him. And Bill Clinton was waiting for him, extended his hand, big smile, lots of photos. That meant the world to President Nixon. President Clinton brings him upstairs to the residence so they can actually talk. They go up in the elevator. The elevator doors open on the residence. They both go to walk out, and boom, right in front of President Nixon's face, is Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> Accompanied by, I think, a 13-year-old Chelsea at the time. And what the president told me afterwards when he got back, he said, he said, all of a sudden the doors open and I'm confronted by Hillary. <laughs> and he said, Mrs. Clinton walked right up to him and she, she never took her eyes off of him, but she didn't extend her hand, she didn't engage in any kind of pleasantries like welcome back to the White House, Mr. President, none of that. She zoned right in on him and she said, Mr. President, your health care reform package of 1973 was way ahead of its time and we're actually going to use it as a template for what we want to do in, in terms of a health care overhaul. Well, you just, I mean, President Nixon was absolutely bowled over by that. He was not expecting that at all. And then she sort of turned on her heel and walked away. And so um, 
uh, President Nixon, the next day when he came back, he said to me, uh, he was recounting the story, and he said, you know, so she says to me, you know, oh, no, I left out the most important part. She said, uh, we're using it as a template, and it was so far ahead of its time, she said, had you survived in office, you would have revolutionized the healthcare sector in this country. So the next day, he's recounting the story, and he says to me, so she says to me, Monica, had I survived in office, well, I may have if she hadn't been trying to impeach me. <laughs> that was President Nixon. And like I started, when I had tears in my eyes thinking about him, because it's my first time back since 94, he was a great man, but more importantly, he was a good man. And I told him every day when I was working with him that I would spend the rest of my life defending him. And he said to me, Monica, you have more important things to do. And then he looked at me and said, but OK. <laughs> and I will spend every day of my life, whenever he is hit, attacked, um, smeared, which he still is every single day, by the press, by these so-called historians who are so invested in demonizing Richard Nixon, I will spend every waking moment turning back those smears and those lies about him and speaking the truth about what a great man he, he was and what a good man he was. And I thank you so much for all of the great work you do. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. That's, that's, those are wonderful stories, and thank you for sharing them with us. Uh, she can add, uh, has a few minutes for questions if anybody uh, would like to pose one. Yes, sir. Tony? Hi, Tony. I'm, I'm Hi. actually. My, oh. my name is actually. I'm actually. Tony's Larry. over here. Hi, Tony. What's your name, sir? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually Larry. I'm a docent here. Hi, Larry. Um, Hi. I wanted to know, uh, uh, do you have, would you like to share any memories of Brownie? Oh, I have a classic story about Brownie. Brownie, uh, does everybody know who Brownie is? Okay, Brownie was a stray dog that had wandered onto their New Jersey property. Um, before I got there, so I arrived in 1990, and I think Brownie started wandering on their property like 1989, and the president used to feed him out the back door, and Mrs. Nixon hated this dog, okay? <laughs> hated the dog. The dog, and I love animals. I really, really do. I, I give to no-kill shelters. I'm a, I'm a huge animal lover, but this dog was satanic. <laughs> this dog was so bad. And, and like wild, it was almost like a wild dog. But the president loved this damn dog. And he kept like feeding the dog. And this dog was, you know, because the dog was living out in the, in the wilderness, it was kind of mangy. It was not very cute. It was just an awful dog. The president took to the dog. Finally, he decided this dog is going to be mine. It has no owner. And he checked with the town, and the dog had no um, license on it or anything. So he ended up <laughs> adopting the dog, much to Mrs. Nixon's horror and chagrin. She never got over this dog. And she said, OK, fine. Dick, you want to have the dog? That's fine. The dog will stay outside, and the dog will stay in your study. The dog is not to be in my bedroom, around me, sniffing me, in the kitchen. She laid out all the rules. So one day, early in my tenure with President Nixon, must have been fall of 1990, uh, he asked me to come over to the house, bring him some materials, so I did. And he was in his study, and he said, come on in, sit down, talk to me a little bit, so I did. And in walks Brownie. And I was a little afraid of the dog, because the dog had these huge fangs and would like, the dog was very protective of the president, which I'd love to see, but he would like sit next to the president and stare me down and like bare his fangs and like just drool at me, you know, like. And so I'm trying to listen to him talk about Gorbachev. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, is this dog going to like lunge at me? What am I going to do? I have nothing to defend myself. I had in my hand that day a government issued pen. So it was a really cheap pen with a cheap plastic top. And, and I'm like writing, you know, government issue. So I'm, I'm writing and, he's, and the dog is staring at me and I'm like, God, I just want to get out of here with this dog. And I'm writing, and all of a sudden, the pen top went flying off the pen. And President Nixon didn't see this, but the pen top rolled on the floor. Wouldn't you know, Brownie lunges for the top of the pen and eats it. <laughs> President Nixon, oblivious, does not. And now I'm thinking, 
the dog is going to choke to death and die on me, and oh, and I'm going to cause the death of the dog that he loves so much because my pen top. So Brownie scoops up the pen top and swallows it, staring at me, mocking me, <laughs> saying to me, come and get it. Come and get it, sister. And I'm thinking, I cannot, I cannot go in this dog's mouth. I just can't do it. I can't do it. So I said to him, Mr. President, I'm sorry to interrupt your brilliance on Gorbachev and the Soviet Union right now, but I think your dog is in a crisis. And he's like, what? What are you talking about? He went in and got the pen top out of Brownie's mouth. And that dog loved him so dearly and was so loyal to him to the very end. Thank you for that question. Brownie. How about one more question? Real quick, Sandy. One more. Because I, I love what you guys do to protect President Nixon's legacy. He meant so much to me. And I just, I'm so grateful for everything you do every day to educate the American people who come through this library every day to tell them the truth about this great man. So I, I'm so grateful to you. And I'll take one more question. Uh oh. <laughs> I always get an Alan Combs question. That's okay. That's okay. I know. So, do you look for real when you guys are bantering back and forth? Yeah. He, one. Yes, it's for real. Okay, well, he is that insane, by the way. <laughs> I love him dearly, and he's my brother-in-law, but he really, he, if your next question is, does he believe all the stuff he says, yeah. he absolutely yeah. believes it. Okay, so, so I love him dearly, but his politics are crazy. <laughs> We have a standing rule, no politics on Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, birthdays, family holidays. We try, we say, look, we're off the clock. This is what we do for a living. We just want to have some nice time not talking politics. My mother, on the other hand, <laughs> who is a very staunch conservative, adored President Nixon so much, um, she's a little bit of a troublemaker. My mother. And so we'll be having a nice Thanksgiving dinner, eating our turkey and our mashed potatoes, and then all of a sudden, my mother will say something like, she'll throw a grenade in the table and she'll say, she'll say, so, Barack Obama, worst president ever, yes? <laughs> and go back to her mashed potatoes. And all of a sudden, it's a food fight, but we try, we try to keep it off limits when we're together in, in uh, private time. My sister is a Democrat. Uh, so they get along great. My mother has no idea how that happened. My mother says, my mother looks at my sister and says, I must have dropped the child on her head when she was a baby. <laughs> Too much buttermilk or something. I don't know. I don't know. But thank you for that. And thank you so much again, you guys. Thank you so much. Bless you. Bless you.